Uh, welcome to uh, AWE. Welcome to uh, the introductory course on augmented reality principles and practice. My name is Tobias Hollerer. Uh, this is uh, Dieter Schmarstieg. And uh, we will guide you through uh, like a series of topics today um, uh, on augmented reality. So first of all, in terms of introductions, Dieter uh, is a, a professor at uh, the Graz University of Technology, um, TU Graz in Austria. And uh, he uh, has been in the field of AR pretty much since its inception. Uh, we will see in a brief history segment that the term was coined in uh, um, uh, 1992 and 1993, and uh, um, Dieter was already working as a grad student uh, on uh, topics related to AR. Uh, his first uh, research paper was on uh, the very influential Studierstube system, which was uh, the first uh, collaborative AR system. My name is Tobias Hollerer. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And uh, I know Dita pretty much from uh, those early days uh, in the 1990s. Um, I did my uh, uh, PhD at Columbia University, uh, um, where I was fortunate enough to join Steve Finer's research group. Uh, and uh, I started uh, research on augmented reality in 1995. And so our first uh, augmented reality research paper was uh, the Turing machine. Uh, in 1997, uh, which was the, the world's first outdoor augmented reality system. Now, I'll show you a, a brief clip uh, when we get to um, that, that historic overview. We will be uh, so, so um, telling you about uh, material that we have gathered together um, over the last five years, uh, a little bit longer, uh, because we, uh, we really saw an opportunity and niche in the um, market for uh, technical AR books that kind of uh, cover the field from a, a research perspective. Um, I did my sabbatical, my last sabbatical in 2009-2010 uh, uh, in Dieter's group in, in Austria. And uh, um, we uh, I've been working on a, a book on augmented reality ever since. So in uh, June last year, it finally came out. Um, it's uh, called Augmented Reality Principles uh, in Practice, uh, uh, published by, by Addison Wesley. And um, the uh, slide sets that we use for these courses that we give uh, um, uh, are actually all online, uh, maybe some modified form uh, um, at augmentedrealitybook.org. We will be joined today, uh, um, later in the session, uh, by Professor Mark Billinghurst, yet another um, pioneer in the field. Uh, he uh, uh, co-developed uh, the very famous and influential AR Toolkit uh, um, augmented reality framework in the uh, mid to, uh, to late 1990s with Hirokazu Kato. Um, Back then he was uh, at the HIT lab uh, um, in, in Washington, uh, Human Interface Technologies Lab. Uh, then he was uh, um, uh, director of the HIT lab New Zealand for uh, uh, like 10 or more years. Uh, and he currently is a professor uh, at the University of South Australia in Adelaide. And uh, so his current focus is uh, collaborative AR, and uh, later in the day he will tell us about uh, interaction, and uh, like all three of us will give you a kind of an outlook of where, where the research field is going. So uh, um, when you look at the, the book, uh, this is uh, the chapters that we kind of systematically categorize the, the field in. Um, the topics that kind of spawn it. And um, even a one-day course, a full-day course, is not enough to cover all these topics, so we uh, had to make a selection, pre-selection uh, um, 
uh, of the topics. Uh, this is by no means uh, final, so if, if, if there are specific uh, suggestions and wishes from the audience, it's a small enough uh, uh, group here, I think, uh, that we uh, can actually adapt to it. We can tell you um, uh, something about all these fields, but uh, what we have worked out as uh, a first selection of these topics for today is uh, these, so heavier uh, on, the, on the intro chapters, obviously. Um, so I'm starting it off right away with uh, an introduction, and then we will cover displays, tracking, including some computer vision. Um, visual coherence, this is uh, the rendering side and uh, how um, the graphics actually best match uh, or coexist in the physical world interaction and then uh, future outlook. And um, that comes together in a schedule like such. Um, as I said, I will be starting it off uh, with the first two uh, sessions, uh, um, intro right after these introductory remarks. Uh, kind of gives an overview of the, the whole field, uh, its history, its challenges, its opportunities. and. Um, then we, uh, we go right into uh, uh, displays, and then Dieter will, uh, before lunch, cover uh, tracking. Um, that covers both uh, uh, tracking modalities, uh, and then specifically, and if you look at our book, you, you, you actually see the focus on it, uh, uh, computer vision techniques uh, for augmented reality, because it's very clear that this is a, uh, or has been a game changer uh, for the field, a, uh, a bootstrapping mechanism to, to really get augmented reality experiences that are worthwhile for the end consumer, not just uh, a uh, gimmick in a research lab. And uh, after lunch, so lunch break will be from 1 to uh, 2.30, uh, Dieter will continue on uh, rendering or visual coherence, as I already mentioned before. And then Mark will join us uh, after a coffee break and uh, um, we'll uh, talk about interaction methodologies. And all of us will be uh, here for a discussion, hopefully uh, interactive, uh, with questions from you guys um, on uh, where this whole field is going. So uh, maybe in comparison to, uh, to lots of uh, like demos and uh, practical applications that you see here at AWE. Uh, um, this course tries to give you uh, like the broader picture. Where did the field come from? What are the important components? What uh, um, uh, are the ingredients for a successful uh, augmented reality system? What should a developer that is starting in the field know? And uh, what technologies are, are there and still developing to become hopefully, as we all think, the interface that will be the most prevalent one for our future interactions with uh, uh, computers. And that's pretty clear to us. Uh, the developments that we have already seen uh, um, with the mobile revolution uh, have led to the fact that people actually like, access uh, the computational layer, like more often via their mobile devices uh, than with anything else. And uh, if you take that to a hands-free uh, um, um, modality, uh, augmented reality is the obvious interface where the physical world becomes your uh, uh, interaction uh, tableau where you can double-click physical objects, basically, and find out information about them. So here uh, is uh, um, an example uh, uh, just filmed uh, with the HoloLens, um, uh, which is really, uh, Microsoft should get a lot of credit for that, um, the current state-of-the-art commercially available uh, uh, device for uh, um, pulling off such experiences. Um, so this is uh, done on, on my campus uh, uh, at UCSB. Um, and it was just to show that uh, the whole lens actually does work reasonably well in the outdoors. Uh, it is not conceived for that. Uh, it has technologies that uh, are reliant on uh, infrared, so our bright sunlight uh, does not um, play nice with uh, um, the tracking mechanism. But uh, in spite of that, you can actually now out of the box 
without any uh, um, uh, development wizardry, which uh, both Dieter and I had to pull off in the uh, decades before that, uh, do things like this uh, with a very, very uh, stable uh, tracking in environment. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I think most of you will know, I have seen a HoloLens. How many of you have worn a HoloLens? It's about half. So hopefully the others are getting the uh, opportunity to do that here at AWE. I don't know uh, how many uh, uh, people will show this, but I'm sure there is going to be HoloLenses around. Um, it is a, a fully self-contained uh, um, computer that is in a uh, like headset form factor. Um, and uh, so here's another uh, uh, video. It also has um, uh, camera sensors, uh, a depth sensor uh, uh, built in. So that you can do uh, uh, interfaces such as this. This is a research that my lab did with the HoloLens. And we demoed uh, uh, just last uh, December for the first time. So you can annotate physical objects from a distance by just drawing in mid-air. And then because there is an, uh, uh, a depth reconstruction uh, module like, like built in, you actually have geometry that, um, uh, that represents the, uh, the objects in your immediate environment. And so whatever you, uh, um, you draw in terms of gestures, in this case arrows in midair, can work out where its projection actually ends up in terms of the physical world. So you can uh, um, annotate the, uh, uh, these physical objects from a distance. Uh, so it's just another uh, uh, example of what you can do with the HoloLens. This is not out of the box. This is a research project using the, uh, the HoloLens, but it is uh, like feasible for a uh, talented grad student to do something like this in a couple of months. Um, so uh, uh, if um, we look at the last few paradigm shifts in human-computer interaction, uh, so I already mentioned uh, that we, uh, we have seen uh, the, the mobile revolution as the last one of these uh, from 2007 when the uh, first iPhone came out until now. Um, so think about uh, uh, what um, the, the real um, new developments were, what the real groundbreakers were. So in the 1980s, it was personal computing, the shift to uh, the desktop, um, where people suddenly saw a need or, or an opportunity of, of using uh, um, desktop computers in their own homes. The next disruption came in the 1990s with uh, um, like thorough networking of these uh, computers that like really became uh, um, prevalent and everywhere through uh, a layer on the internet, uh, the World Wide Web. That was the 1993 to 1995 uh, is when that happens. And um, since the early 2000s, uh, that connectivity uh, has multiplied so that um, uh, you don't just have consumers, but everyone is also an information producer. And so that led to social computing and the uh, idea that one person's data is useful for driving the infrastructure for uh, people to follow. Um, at the same time, cloud computing started to happen so that you came independent of um, hardware, in, in, at least in terms of like uh, important applications um, that now didn't necessarily live on your own hardware but could live on a, a large distributed server architecture in the cloud. And then the, uh, um, the mobile revolution that I already talked about. And if you look at that trajectory, one thing is very clear. Um, the uh, computing becomes more and more personalized and more and more context driven. And uh, context uh, for the mobile revolution means that you have uh, an environment that you may want to know more about or you're using your computer uh, in a certain uh, situation and you want to just get the necessary information to support you in that situation. 
And for that, you are even taking a, a, a phone out of your pocket, putting it on, selecting an app, and then entering some query is too long. So since the 1990s, uh, the field of wearable computing has really uh, um, uh, tried to address that particular uh, uh, latency of uh, getting to information with an always-on model of uh, uh, information support. And uh, coupled with the ability to overlay computer graphics on top of the physical world, you have a very powerful uh, mechanism to retrieve information that is specific to your current uh, situation, to your current location, and you use this uh, physical reality as your interface. Now, interestingly, we haven't achieved uh, uh, another research vision that Mark Weiser uh, um, from Xerox PARC uh, postulated in the late 1990s, and that is ubiquitous computing or calm computing. So uh, calm computing would be the idea that like, uh, the computers are not really on us, they are everywhere around us, and uh, they support us because they actually are the context. And um, the problem with that is that I can see is that uh, if, if you rely on a, a centralized uh, uh, architecture of lots of computing devices, who's going to maintain that? In our day and age, uh, computing shifts still shifts so fast that uh, um, today's hardware is obsolete in two years, uh, one and a half years, something like that. And somehow, the uh, companies driving the uh, mobile revolution have convinced us that it is necessary personally to take charge and update our phone infrastructures. So that happens on a personal basis. So that is happening. So everything that has this personal mo motivation has taken a, a, an immense leap. But a everything that is more research-oriented, centralized, where you have to roll out an infrastructure for a smart airport, uh, a smart city, we need to invent methods to actually make the maintenance and updates and uh, um, power problems uh, uh, easier in order for that to happen. Until then, we rely on uh, um, the uh, appeal of people like uh, wanting this layer of uh, additional information for their personal needs. And so uh, the smartphone or uh, a smartphone that can be put near to your eyes or uh, um, some glasses coupled with a smartphone later on um, could be the next driver for that. All right. So uh, when we're talking about augmented reality, of course we need a definition. And uh, I told you that Dieter and I are coming from the research community uh, on augmented reality. Uh, and so since the 1990s, the research community actually has agreed on a definition for augmented reality. Um, and uh, so don't get worried about so many uh, uh, different terms out there. Um, mixed reality, augmented reality. Uh, um, uh, it um, mostly refers to uh, the same thing, but there is uh, a, a historic source for these. Um, augmented reality uh, uh, was defined by Ron Azuma in 1997 with uh, three conditions. So it combines the real and the virtual in the real world and that's important, so that's uh, actually predominantly in the real world. It happens interactively and re in real time, so it's not a, uh, um, a canned presentation that is just filmed. And it's registered in 3D, so it's not just 2D overlays, or it's not just uh, um, like, uh, like rough uh, like orientation matches. And so this is a pretty a pretty stringent uh, requirement, all three of these. So, so several things that we probably readily uh, would accept as augmented reality might just be borderline cases in here. Like the first downline in TV uh, for football games. So I'm one of the first really successful uh, uh, augmented reality demonstrations that really became useful and beloved and uh, um, people actually uh, want that experience in the stadium because it would help them, right? 
But when you have it mediated via TV, it's not clear if it actually uh, um, uh, uh, fulfills the condition two here, interactive, in real time. So it's interactive uh, from the perspective of the uh, person carrying the, uh, the camera on the field, right? Because when, while they move, uh, actually, the, uh, the line stays uh, stable. But it's not interactive from the perspective of the, uh, the end TV user. So, so you could debate if, uh, if it qualifies. It is normally definitely classified under AR experiences, just because uh, it has this tracking uh, uh, element. Or take uh, uh, augmented reality games, like Pokemon Go, right? So is that uh, um, augmented reality? Well, it definitely places uh, um, uh, virtual elements in the real world, in the view that you maybe tried out in the beginning and then uh, um, turned off uh, for um, more convenient gameplay for the rest of your uh, Pokemon Go career. Um, but it actually didn't have very um, stringent uh, real-time uh, tracking. It had orientation tracking, uh, but then the position tracking was just very, very rough and uh, uh, approximate. So again, you could argue, is it uh, augmented reality? And again, you would probably fold it into this definition and say, yes, it's still interactive, it's still real-time, it is registered in 3D, but it could m be much more, um, uh, much more accurate. Okay, so I talked about mixed reality. So, so often uh, these two are now conflated or companies are using the terms uh, to distinguish themselves uh, in this uh, uh, space. Um, from the research perspective, uh, there is actually a definition that dates back to uh, Paul Milgram, uh, early 1990s papers or mid 1990s papers, where he um, introduced a spectrum that ranges from reality to virtual reality, right? And we all know what virtual reality is, uh, even though its boundaries are currently being uh, um, kind of softened up and uh, uh, we already see some confluence between augmented reality and virtual reality, but uh, virtual reality would actually put you into a computer-generated world, completely block off any uh, um, physical reality and uh, just make it appear as if you live in this uh, uh, computer-generated universe. Reality is uh, what we hopefully still uh, live in. Sometimes it seems doubtful, but uh, yes, uh, um, I think uh, we are still in a physical reality. I uh, have to knock on wood here. And uh, um, in between, you have a spectrum. Right, so you uh, uh, you could introduce some computer-generated elements, and they don't have to be just graphical. They can be sound, they can be uh, haptic, uh, they can be other modalities, and so you would uh, uh, go from this end of the spectrum to augmented reality, where you still pre predominantly live into the phys in the physical world, but you introduce augmentations. And you could also come from this side of the spectrum. You could say, uh, so I have this computer-generated world, but now I bring in real elements. And the real elements would first be photographs of reality. Then there would be reconstructions, very realistic reconstructions of photorealistic uh, um, physical structures. Um, and then you would get into the space of augmented virtuality. Okay? So that's the space that Paul Milgram built. And then uh, I already talked about Mark Weiser's vision of uh, uh, ubiquitous computing, um, where he uh, uh, said that computing would be woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. So he correctly predicted uh, like this very rough distribution of uh, computers per person. Um, so we had the mainframe time, which uh, was already in decline uh, by the time he, he kind of uh, postulated these ideas. The PC revolution had, was in full upswing, uh, one person, one computer. And he predicted that that would go uh, down at some point and one person, many computers, would actually take over. And that finally happened uh, uh, like from 2007 onwards. And by th 2010, we had more uh, mobile devices sold than, uh, than desktops. Um, and uh, so Mark Weiser didn't live to, uh, to see the, um, 
the realization of his uh, prophecy here. So, uh, so unfortunately, he uh, died in 1999. But his legacy lives on. And uh, he was never a big fan of virtual reality. <laughs> in fact, uh, he said, so, so his, his vision of ubiquitous computing was uh, antithesal, uh, so it was opposite of, uh, um, uh, of what, uh, what he perceived as the computer supporting uh, people. Because in virtual reality, you'd be locked in in uh, like one very uh, 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 constrained environment. He didn't really see the success of uh, augmented reality back then, uh, but I think the vision was there. And uh, um, he, he was skeptical, but uh, uh, augmented reality is actually a pathway to, uh, to, to merge uh, um, these, these two visions of ubiquitous computing and uh, augmented reality. So in, this, in our book, uh, uh, Dieter uh, has actually uh, um, like structured uh, the space like this. Um, where he combined uh, the mixed reality spectrum by Paul Milgram with the Weiser uh, continuum that you could presume between like a stationary computer up here and the ubiquitous uh, lots of computer scenario that are uh, like in the background of our lives embedded everywhere. And augmented reality is actually uh, uh, over here in this quadrant, right, on the real side and definitely uh, uh, on the ubiquitous side. So it does support this notion of uh, um, being the glue between different uh, uh, computers very well. So it is actually a, uh, a computational uh, substrate, right, that can build the interface on ubiquitous computing environments. So you see some other spaces, right? There's stationary augmented reality, which is more like uh, like real high-end uh, cable tracked uh, with uh, mechanical trackers laboratory uh, setups, similar to virtual reality, but more on the real side. Um, I already mentioned augmented reality. And then there's also distributed virtual realities, uh, for example, massive multiplayer online games, right? which is very high on the uh, distributed and multi-devices side, uh, and also high on the uh, virtual side of the spectrum. OK, so what is needed um, for um, augmented reality? So augmented reality is a human in the loop interface. You uh, um, have the human as a user here in the center. And then a spatial model of computation is uh, uh, constructed around them. Virtual content is uh, supplanting in the physical world. Uh, and the real world needs to be modeled in order to make this uh, match of uh, graphics or uh, otherwise information overlays. And then you need um, uh, tracking, which we will talk about, which leads to registration of uh, materials that are virtual with physical objects. That, that just means like, like making them appear at the same place and in the same orientation. And then you, uh, uh, you will design situated visualizations that actually are meaningful in the physical world and interaction mechanisms that uh, are coupled with user input. So that's the big picture, right? And uh, so going into uh, a very brief uh, history whirlwind, so I really will just uh, like hit the highlights here. Um, Ivan Sutherland uh, built the first augmented reality display in, uh, in 1968, uh, which was nicknamed the Sword of Democles because uh, it had a mechanical tracker and it was uh, joked by uh, uh, him and his colleagues that uh, it's kind of, it could come down and kill you any time. Uh, so it's uh, kind of hanging there from the ceiling. Um, but it really was an augmented reality device, and, and that was uh, um, like 25 years before the, the term augmented reality was even termed, uh, coined. Uh, so it did overlay uh, graphics, line graphics though, like oscilloscope kind of uh, um, uh, vector graphics uh, on top of a, a physical board so that you could have a virtual interface there. Um, so now 25 years later is really the next notable uh, um, event in the timeline of uh, augmented reality because, uh, as I said, the, um, the, the term was coined then by uh, uh, Dave, Dave Mizell and Tom Codell. Um, 
uh, they worked at Boeing and uh, had the problem or uh, like saw the physical problem of uh, um, uh, wire bundle assembly for aircraft. And they had these, these huge uh, um, like boards that they had to print for each aircraft in the size of the aircraft. And uh, the wires were actually aligned right there on these uh, immense boards. And uh, uh, it was very expensive uh, to do uh, a new physical blueprint and assembly uh, board uh, like that. Uh, and so one step forward would be to use augmented reality and then you could actually digitally change the, uh, the assembly bundles. And it would be much easier, much cheaper. And uh, the technology was not quite there, but the idea was there. And uh, a field was really like uh, jump-started by uh, ideas such as theirs. So in uh, Steve Feiner's lab, which I said I, I was uh, um, fortunate enough to join in 1995, uh, augmented reality research uh, was in full blast by that time um, in an academic setting. So uh, uh, at Columbia University, his group uh, um, did research on overlaying, again, uh, like early heads-up display uh, um, uh, graphics for maintenance, like, uh, uh, and combining it with AI, with knowledge-based uh, uh, recommendation systems of uh, what should come next, so understanding the physical world. Um, and so, so these early works uh, uh, continue to, to inform what is being done in, in uh, the industry uh, right now. At the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, uh, the group around uh, uh, Henry Fuchs um, did uh, uh, visualizations of uh, uh, ultrasound imagery, um, here enabling uh, um, the, uh, the view of uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an infant in a, um, in, in a mother's womb and the position not just by uh, experts, but just by uh, um, nurses and caregivers that maybe do not have the, uh, the expertise to read uh, like the, uh, the imaging technologies that were around correctly to, uh, to uh, uh, interpret the pose. So very powerful uh, uh, initial visualizations there. Meantime, uh, at uh, um, Sony CSL, uh, Yun Rekimoto, uh, um, did handheld uh, overlays with the Navicam of uh, um, not fully self-contained computers, but at least displays that were tracked in the physical worlds, and that became the first information browsers. And uh, uh, I already mentioned in the introduction for uh, Dieter's work, uh, the first collaborative augmented reality system that was done uh, in his group, um, uh, that was done at uh, TU Vienna, actually. Uh, and uh, one application of, uh, of this system, and you still see like cabling and uh, um, uh, tracking uh, that was outside in. We will talk about uh, the possibilities there. Uh, this is an uh, um, educational application for high school students like learning uh, geometry. So they can jointly actually uh, author these environments. So this was done in a research setting in the mid-1990s, right? just to, to give you a reference. So this, this field didn't just start in uh, um, the last five years. It, it became really popular uh, in that time, but the ideas are around for a long, long time. But now we can do this much more cheaply, much more robustly, and uh, um, it is finally entering uh, the, uh, um, the space of real applications. This was a real application, but it was not deployed because it would have been too expensive for any school to actually have a system like that and maintain it. It was a uh, technical wizardry to actually uh, uh, make this happen in the first place. Um, but now it is possible, stand uh, alone, off the shelf, available. This is the work that I mentioned before that I was involved in. Uh, um, for my graduate studies. Uh, so this is yours truly here in 1997, uh, walking around, people calling out Ghostbusters after us. <laughs> that movie was actually, uh, the real movie, right? The old movie, it was actually filmed on Columbia's campus. So uh, um, there was a link there. Um, and uh, so this was the uh, ridiculous gear we had to wear 
Uh, and these were the kind of visuals that we generated. Let me show you just a, a, a brief video there from that work. Um, so we, we can select uh, uh, these, these flags, virtual flags that uh, uh, kind of indicate uh, uh, story points in the history of the campus, actually, in this case. And uh, up comes a, uh, um, uh, a wing of the Bloomingdale Asylum for the Insane, because that is what, uh, what covered Columbia's grounds because before Columbia moved there, causing some people to say that things really didn't change all that much. And uh, uh, we had a handheld computer in 1997, running Windows 97. And uh, um, we, ha we used it as a kind of uh, um, like time machine to uh, browse the history of, uh, uh, of the Bloomingdale Asylum um, complex. And up would pop the, uh, uh, the buildings in front of you. So this play technology that we used there was very low resolution, uh, but there was a company called Virtual I.O. that made these. And then later on in 1998 or 1999, from which this footage is, uh, it was a Sony Glastron uh, uh, display. So the gaming uh, uh, industry caught on. And uh, there was um, like one big initiative, and specifically uh, uh, in Japan, called the Mixed Reality uh, Initiative. Uh, a mixed reality systems laboratory, or uh, MRSL, was founded, half funded by Canon and half funded by the Japanese government. And they did uh, amazing work over the period of uh, five years and uh, kind of drove the, uh, um, the, the visuals and application scenarios for um, indoor, mostly indoor, they had an outdoor project as well, uh, shared uh, uh, augmented reality experiences. Uh, meanwhile, at the University of uh, uh, South Australia, where uh, um, Mark Billinghurst now is, uh, um, uh, he will join us later today, as I mentioned before, um, Bruce Thomas and his group uh, with Wayne Pikarski uh, um, like took the, the, the game Quake and uh, uh, made an outdoor uh, uh, AR experience out of it uh, by just placing the characters. Uh, very pixelated still, but... Uh, um, uh, with outdoor tracking uh, into the physical world. And then uh, I already mentioned Mark's work on with uh, Hirokazu, Kazu, um, Hirokazu Kato uh, on uh, the AR toolkit, uh, which was the first real like uh, grassroots AR um, movement that they spawned off with that because Computer vision was not at a point where we could readily interpret or track natural scenes, but what could be done really fast was to track uh, uh, artificial fiducials or markers such as this. And so they built the software to do that very reliably in the form of uh, what became the AR toolkit. And uh, um, uh, that found an uh, um, open source community and uh, a lot of uh, um, developers actually jumped onto this opportunity. Around the same time uh, in my whirlwind tour, uh, Jim Spora had uh, um, the vision of a uh, world board, um, the uh, idea of the world being um, divided into like one cube meter uh, volumes, at least the surface of it. Uh, and uh, a company, Apple, because uh, Jim uh, worked for Apple at that time, and then later uh, uh, he wrote the paper up as, uh, uh, at IBM, um, would be the uh, maintainer of uh, an inventory system of these uh, one meter cubes uh, uh, around the world. And objects would be tracked, and uh, uh, one person could leave uh, notes for other persons, uh, and so on and so forth. So that never got implemented, but it was a thought experiment paper uh, that uh, very much fit with uh, the research that I was involved with uh, that I showed you before uh, at Columbia. So then in, in real games, uh, um, you, you saw like, augmented reality experiences. Uh, so in real commercial games, as early as 2007, when Sony came out with the card game uh, Eye, Eye of Judgment. And, uh, deliver the camera with, uh, with the actual game play to, to have the computer graphics uh, uh, elements battle each other and uh, maintain uh, the uh, like bookkeeping of uh, um, this, this card exchange game. 
Dieter's group a few years before uh, had shown that you can, with handheld computers, actually uh, um, create very compelling experiences in augmented reality. So you had uh, this, uh, this board, uh, this train uh, track uh, at SIGGRAPH in 2004, for example, where these PDAs, anybody here still remember PDAs? Yeah, it wasn't public uh, display of affection. Um, even though people were quite affected with these little devices before they became smartphones. It could, with markers, as you can see here, using the AI toolkit markers, uh, give a tracking experience that uh, actually provided a collaborative game plan. So then, uh, um, fast forward here. Uh, so research at TU Graz actually uh, led to really robust tracking for mobile devices uh, um, that are not necessarily based on these markers with the black borders anymore. Because now you could actually do this. Uh, so the next step was to use uh, any kind of tracking pattern. Still planar mostly, um, but the markers got replaced by any kind of texture. Right, that's the next big step. So that's what Vuforia really excelled uh, uh, in doing. Um, uh, and it came out of uh, Adidas Lab originally and then uh, was developed by Qualcomm and uh, by PTC since 2015. And we will have a, a, a PTC or several PTC presentations here at AWE. Um, the uh, idea is to get from these very distinct markers to markers that blend in to the physical environment to not having any markers at all and having computer vision that just tracks uh, um, uh, any device uh, with uh, features that occur in the natural world. And we are at that transition from uh, um, uh, like blending in markers, blended in markers to completely uh, uh, natural features. So uh, um, I already gave Microsoft a lot of credit for uh, um, like pulling all of this uh, into one uh, like cohesive form factor. Uh, it's really a, uh, uh, an engineering tour de force what they did. Uh, um, it's a, a self-contained Windows 10 computer um, with an optical see-through display uh, with depth camera and uh, two of in total uh, um, four wide field of few cameras that actually uh, uh, cover the outside environment so that you can do natural feature tracking with it. As hardware accelerated tracking and mapping, which uh, we will cover, Dita will talk about in the tracking session, SLAM, simultaneous <coughs> localization and mapping. And uh, it's doing a really good job on that. It's not perfect, but it is uh, uh, giving you, it will give you a fairly robust experience in most in environments. Um, so also since last year, we have other developments in this sector, uh, the Daiquiri smart, smart Helmet uh, and uh, the Meta Display, which is now available as a, uh, um, uh, the Meta 2 as a uh, um, development kit. And uh, just to give you a real quick uh, um, overview of possible applications, um, so lots of uh, possibilities in this space, right? So anywhere where you can uh, um, where you want to, to, to comment and refer to the physical world, augmented reality will have an impact. Um, so here's a, a, a few uh, um, areas. So for example, uh, uh, if you, if you are um, in, the, in industry and construction, you can, make a, you can do a discrepancy analysis uh, in, in industrial facilities between a model that you have of uh, uh, some factory equipment with uh, uh, the CAD information that uh, you, you have for, for building the, uh, the environment. Uh, so you can actually see if anything changed, if uh, um, anything deviated from the plans, if there's any problems and so on and so forth. And you do that in situ. This was by uh, uh, Nasir Navab's group and at TU Munich. Same, a similar uh, kind of idea here in the industrial setting. Uh, the platform that they used uh, is, is kind of not a headset, uh, but they thought that it would be uh, um, like more convenient for a factory hall to roll this, this kind of uh, uh, AR screen, um, a mobile platform around, and have visual uh, um, re reconstructions uh, and overlays of the, uh, the factory halls here on this uh, screen. Um, Dita did work uh, with um, 
several uh, civic uh, um, like environmental uh, agencies uh, to uh, um, do the ma uh, maintenance and comparison of underground uh, uh, infrastructure and, and use augmented reality or do a, a test case of how augmented reality could be used for that. It's a very important topic. And I mentioned before the difficulty in actually maintain, maintaining equipment in the physical world. Well, you can use augmented reality to make that problem easier by actually uh, um, providing like uh, mobile workers with the, uh, the visuals uh, of, of where problem areas might be, uh, where they have to dig, and so on and so forth. Or you could do this, uh, so this is underground. You could also go high up in the air with drones, right? You can use augmented reality overlaid on top of uh, um, air pho aerial photography that comes from these uh, flying critters. Or you can use the imagery from uh, the drones to actually build models, an important ingredient for uh, augmented reality, as we will see throughout this course. So here's uh, um, like a, a consideration in terms of user interface. You want to, uh, once you have a model of the environment, give very informative and useful instructions of how uh, the physical, the um, thing that you want to comment about with your augmentations functions or uh, um, uh, how to maintain it. And so you have to actually work in areas such as automated layout and the best uh, um, uh, visualization techniques for uh, uh, specific application purposes. This is uh, an application from my lab uh, uh, on collaborative uh, um, mobile augmented reality. I can show you a quick video here. Um, actually, let me uh, just talk over it. Um, so, so this is actually now uh, has, has uh, transitioned to uh, uh, PTC, the Euphoria team. Um, but uh, uh, the idea was to have a, uh, um, uh, a mobile tablet which actually is fully self-contained, wireless, and it tracks and builds a model of a uh, um, like physical environment, this, uh, this uh, motor of the car. And a remote expert could independently um, like annotate uh, the same scene. Um, and a mobile user would get the uh, uh, annotations physically, spatially uh, uh, fixed in the physical world. And, uh, and there's an independent operation of the model that emerges uh, by the remote expert and the uh, mobile user who actually gets the advice in the field. Medical diagnosis has uh, uh, taken great leaps uh, um, since uh, the, the first ultrasound imagery that I showed you uh, uh, in the 1990s. And uh, it actually is, um, AR is in practice in several um, uh, medical institutions for surgery, but then also for diagnosis. So we have uh, um, the vision and, of course, on, on our smartphones, the praxis, uh, practice of AR browsers. It's just that people don't currently really use it. Right? You have this built in with Yelp. You have this built in with uh, standalone applications like uh, Wikitudes or uh, um, Layer. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet because we don't have this uh, um, absolute um, grassroots movement uh, yet that jump starts uh, uh, a new interface uh, metaphor like this. But this course can actually kind of like uh, lay out the, the roadmap to something like this really becoming uh, ubiquitous. And things like this have happened, but on your smartphone, not uh, um, like uh, in always on augmented reality. Right? So translation with Google Lens, the latest uh, announcements at Google I.O., Google Lens has become uh, like a really, really uh, central piece of their uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, is doing something like this, like in situ uh, um, uh, translations of, uh, um, of any text. Very, very useful uh, if you don't speak the language but uh, are in this uh, new environment. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit um, to, uh, to conclude this intro session here on time uh, um, by, uh, by the hour. Uh, navigation, um, uh, there's lots of applications there. We have a whole chapter on this uh, in, uh, uh, in our book. 
Um, this is a part of navigation where you actually have um, products already that uh, um, like give you assistance for parking. This is in this weird, we're in this weird transit uh, space for cars, right? Where we, don't, where we actually have the technology for self-driving cars, but uh, for legal reasons and other reasons, reliability reasons, uh, we, don't, we won't have them for another five to 10 years. So now we can actually use AR to make our own driving easier. And hopefully we make it easier and don't uh, do the opposite by uh, distracting people with AR overlays, which is also a distinct possibility. Um, already talked about uh, sports overlays. Augmented magazines were uh, uh, kind of in the like second part of the 2000s, uh, uh, a good possibility for advertisement using AR. Marketing has uh, a lot of use for AR, um, especially for like uh, showing the features of a particular product and showing how the product looks in full glory, in full space, in a like environment that you might, might want to put it as a, as a customer. Same for uh, um, uh, fashion and, and uh, online commerce, where you can actually, uh, so this is from like a, a smartphone app that uh, also came out of Dita's group, uh, Reactive Reality, where you can really just click on uh, um, example clothes and uh, see uh, yourself fitted with it uh, 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 on a smartphone app. So that's, uh, that app's called PictoFit. And an immersive games uh, here with the immersive uh, uh, ROM uh, research from uh, um, um, uh, Microsoft Research, uh, where you have this interesting space between VR and AR, because people probably want to uh, uh, put entertainment into their own environments. So the physical reality will play a big role, bigger and bigger, right? And people um, already kind of see the limits of virtual reality. Augmented reality is a little bit more open, uh, but it also has challenges in terms of uh, uh, reacting to uh, and sensing the physical uh, environment. So with that, um, I'm right on time for this hour. Uh, um, so this was just the intro session, but we could use it as a, uh, um, as a particular opportunity for you to maybe point out your interest in like these particular areas so that we uh, can maybe uh, get an idea of, uh, of where we put more focus for the rest of uh, today's presentation. Um, so this is the list again uh, um, that we, uh, of topics that we can talk about. This is the, uh, the schedule and here highlighted in red um, uh, of what we uh, have planned to cover. So that, from this overview presentation, are there any questions? Are there any uh, particular voices of interest for specific topics? Let's hear from you. Yes. Yeah, <coughs> I'm, uh, I think this is a great overview. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm kind of, I'm going to speak for myself, I'm interested in you know, practical applications. And I think, um, I, I love Microsoft HoloLens. I, I think it's an amazing piece of hardware. Um, I think it's going to be some time until it gets, like I'm looking at applications in the field of the enterprise. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in kind of walking before we can run, because to implement full-scale augmented reality applications of Microsoft HoloLens in the enterprise, I think it's going to be some time off because of some of the form factor challenges right. and other challenges. What I am interested in, though, is that there's a lot of technology out there that isn't as um, aspirational as Microsoft Hollands, but I still think there are opportunities to implement AR in some of the lower tech devices right. that are more comfortable to wear in the field. I'm kind of interested in what your thoughts are if you might cover some of the techniques. Of course, those, those devices won't have the map, mapping capabilities of a, of a HoloLens, but I still think there are techniques you could use to Right. That's, that's great. Uh, um, as I hopefully make clear through the history segment, so Dita's group uh, was uh, like really instrumental in establishing AR for the mobile device uh, kind of market, which is really the biggest uh, uh, kind of environment out there right now with people ready with the devices to do something like that. So maybe he can uh, take this question for the time. 
Well, I mean, it, it's obviously a tough one. There's, a, there's a, uh, several thousand people here who are trying to do exactly that. But uh, if, uh, if you want to build on top of the hardware that everybody is already owning, that uh, puts very strong constraints upon you, the least common denominator type of thing. Huh? Um, I believe... Um, so, so this is something that may come up uh, later today. If we can solve the content creation problem, then stuff could be delivered on existing devices, which would be like smartphone handsets, for example, uh, in, in a reasonable way, um, although not completely satisfactory for my taste, but that's, that's not necessarily a business case. Um, uh, but uh, and you would still have economic issues. You have to hold devices in your hand, which uh, raises fatigue and so on. Um, but uh, but the general problem is how do you get uh, content that is worthwhile showing in a in a contextual uh, situation right now? Um, so if you want to use existing handsets then probably you can, I mean, you can use some of the existing tracking technology or maybe also just uh, detection technology that just tells you you're in a specific room, you're looking at a specific person, you are looking at a specific object, but then don't have this 3D matching on, the, on a high level of precision. But you still deliver some of the content. But that would mean that, for example, for a company having lots of products or machines or whatever infrastructure, you would have to build a pipeline that can bring... Uh, let's say, the 3D computer aided design models onto the handsets in a more or less automatic kind of way. Um, the, the slide that uh, Tobias is showing here, um, this is actually an interesting example because in the, in the fashion industry, there's hundreds of thousands of products every season and they're changing all the time. And again, it's a content creation problem. There's photo shoots with models that show these uh, fashion items uh, there's also ghost models where they're actually removing in Photoshop the, the face of the model and the neck of the model and all the body parts. So you see a disembodied but worn piece of garment. Uh, and this technology is, uh, is sort of morphing that onto uh, the, the, the picture of a person or the video of a person. And in that way you can reuse the existing uh, fashion photography, even though it was never designed to be used in an augmented reality context. Whereas you, if you wanted to pay somebody to do 3D garment modeling, I mean, game industry does that, they pay specialists for hundreds of hours to do a, a collection of garments for, for avatars or something like that. That is not economical. Uh, so I, I believe this way may be one of the key factors. If you can go to uh, more advanced, um, devices like, like the HoloLens, like scanning, the 3D scanning devices that we mentioned, then of course the content creation, the stuff that you're going to show and the stuff that you're going to register in real time, this becomes much easier. Then you do the content creation more on the fly. With limited hardware, that is, I think, one of the main obstacles. I mean, that's only a partial answer, but... Uh, but I think also this example yeah. uh, uh, showcases yeah. uh, um, how you can just use uh, a simple tablet and maybe a still image in this case that you snap off yourself for a very worthwhile augmented reality experience, right? So this is low-key augmented reality like you uh, alluded to. Uh, this doesn't have to do a, um, like dynamic tracking. It just has to adapt to one snapshot. Um, uh, but it has to do a good job on that, right? And that's definitely technically feasible, but it, it needs to, it's still a technical problem that needs to be solved, especially in conjunction with uh, uh, the authoring that, uh, that Dieter mentioned. So how do you automatically actually make that happen and make look good in every single, single occasion? So maybe, maybe it should be more called something like product lifecycle management. Uh, it's not just the authoring, it's the problem of having the information when you're finally going to need it, and it has to fit into the business processes, and these are not designed to support augmented reality. And if you combine that constraint, that you do not necessarily have the right kind of source or workflow in place, with the other constraint of using the lowest uh, level denominator hardware, then you don't have much room to operate in. If you can release either of those constraints, it's going to be better, and hopefully this will happen soon. More questions uh, or uh, just a coffee break? Yeah. What time does the interaction meet? Interaction will be uh, uh, at 4 o'clock. Yeah. 4 p.m. 
And actually, all three of us have uh, uh, done work in, in interaction for, for AR, but uh, Mark will, will take the lead as uh, like uh, the, the most well-known proponent. Yes? So along the line, I have one more question. So sure. You said uh, how the platform will be is one of the challenging components, but looking at how they come from, there are a lot of things, like optics is one thing, display, or computer vision algorithm, or the exotic silicon. In your view, what is the most challenging part when you say how they are platform? <laughs> Most challenging part of the hardware platform, all of the above. Uh, I think the display is, is definitely uh, 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 still needs some improvement, especially in form factor. And there's even some doubts that you can get it to a form factor that is really socially acceptable at all, right? That you can get it to like normal looking glasses at all with uh, reasonable uh, um, like uh, visuals. But I think uh, a lot of uh, people working in the area are more optimistic uh, uh, on it. Um, the tracking, we see already a very good implementation, reference implementation uh, uh, by the HoloLens, for example. That's probably Tango. the best implementation right now. Google Tango. And Google Tango, yeah. Uh, it's uh, uh, not solved yet by any means, so don't get fooled uh, by hearing uh, uh, tracking is solved. There will be uh, many tracking problems uh, that are still open, especially as uh, 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 when dealing with the semantics of a scene, right? So this is the intersection of uh, uh, sensors and interpretation of a, uh, a scene with computer vision and uh, artificial intelligence, like uh, we see a, a revolution right now with deep learning. Um, so uh, the conjunction of these uh, has tons of opportunity uh, uh, still to come. Uh, and then power, battery power, I think is, uh, is something that, uh, um, that shouldn't be overlooked here as a real, real uh, big constraint. Uh, right now, the whole lens gives you what, uh, like maximum of a couple of hours or something like that, and that's not in heavy use. So I mean, we're giving demos with these devices and uh, we need to keep them on a, on a charging cable. And even on a charging cable, they, uh, they, draw, they, they lose, uh, um, they lose uh, battery energy uh, um, uh, still when, when, you, when you actually uh, uh, really tax the system. So, so those are the three uh, that, that I see as the main uh, limits. I, I would basically agree. I think uh, one way to slice this uh, question is that software is always going to be easier than hardware because uh, software you can change without, you know, rolling out any physical modifications. So this is why displays and batteries will prevail as being big, big roadblocks. Um, and and th th this is why tracking algorithms, for example, are relatively cheap to improve because you just write new software. Um, and uh, as far as the hardware itself is concerned, there are pieces of the hardware like the GPU, the graphics uh, processor, for example, that uh, are driven by other factors like gaming. You know, they just become better because people want to play the next whatever, uh, Mario on, on tablets or whatever. Um, and uh, so we don't have to take care about that. Uh, we only have to make sure that the specific needs of augmented reality systems are not forgotten. Um, and yeah, th th this means that actually I, I agree that the displays themselves are probably the hardest part. Was there another hand? Yeah, maybe last question for now. Thank you, this is great information. <coughs> Great. We have a solution for the uh, fashion app. So what? Where's, where's the problem that I'm having that I need this? I think that's a really good good comment because uh, um, uh, in the early years of uh, uh, of this space, where there was no commercial um, viability uh, to be seen, it was driven by just, hey, what can we do? And now it should be uh, much more on pull what is necessary and what do the customers want. That's, I think, a very uh, uh, good uh, um, comment. But I think, specifically in the example of the, uh, the, the fashion app, I think the, um, the, the, the need or want is there for uh, somebody who doesn't go 
to a uh, brick and mortar shop, but actually just looks at uh, um, uh, virtual garments and wants to see what they look like in them. I think that's a perfect uh, uh, commercial um, uh, application uh, that, that really makes uh, um, AR commerce, commerce scale, right? So in that particular scene, I, I'm not sure I see the criticism uh, of it. Uh, um, but it was an example that came out of so your group. So the, the target group are primarily female, 15 to 30 year old. If you are primarily female and 15 to 13 year old, please raise your hand in this audience. Uh, <laughs> I don't see too many who would qualify as uh, fashion aficionados. Uh, and uh, for them, social inspiration is a very important uh, direction. So sharing and the, uh, uh, and the this is actually what drives this particular development. And uh, also, the, I mean, there's the, the long-term vision of reducing return rates on, on online commerce because of better fitting and better, you know, matching to taste. Great. So I don't know if there is coffee currently outside, but uh, I would just soldier on and uh, um, uh, go on with the display uh, segment and then uh, uh, at noon we would have a maybe quick break before the tracking and then uh, we're going lunch late today uh, uh, with one o'clock with our current time schedule um, uh, actually you know we could we could actually also shift uh, tracking to after lunch and then after lunch break and then having uh, so. having two is there a preference for this let's actually qu quickly show us show of hands what's the the, um, the lunch habits here uh, of our crowd. Would you rather go to lunch at noon? Raise your hand right now. Would you rather go to lunch at one? Raise your hand right now. Oh, it's exactly split in the middle, kind of. I think I saw, uh, um, I think I, uh, we just keep what we have. Uh, so uh, so let, me, uh, let me go on with, um, okay with uh, displays, because we already ha had a question on displays uh, um, as a really important component. Um, all right. Augmented reality displays, yes. So these slides, not exactly these slides, but the basis for the slides is already currently available at this URL right here. These very slides, uh, we can actually load up uh, in, a, in a subfolder there after the, the session. We did that before. So, yeah. Because there are some additions to it uh, that just make them more up to date than what is currently uh, uh, at, at our book site. But this may take after, uh, until after AWE. Okay, so uh, uh, let's start with the observation that uh, um, there's another question there. Hi, uh, sorry, I was trying to ask the question about the various applications you've shown. Yeah. There's a very broad range, and I'm wondering if you have thought about augmented reality applications for various types of products, such as the Apple Watch, Apple Watch Pro, 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 Apple Watch Pro,
is something that is somewhat orthogonal to the uh, technology of uh, augmented reality. So uh, multimodal uh, displays, let's start with that, um, because uh, when, you think, when you hear displays, you think immediately visual, right? Like uh, that's what, what we kind of see as displays. But augmented reality is not a visual only uh, modality. Um, in fact, you can augment uh, all of your five senses, and six if you have a sixth one, I don't know. Um, and uh, uh, there have been examples for uh, uh, the, the different um, um, options for, for other modalities. And in fact, I mean, when you think about audio, the first augmented reality uh, incarnations came in this domain right, in the audio domain, because you had museum audio guides sin since the 1950s. In the early days, they were implemented with uh, just radio broadcasts that uh, came out of speakers in a different room, so it was closed circuit radio uh, in some sense. And uh, they, they, they would actually give you a uh, particular group listening experience while going from uh, um, place to place in a museum. And then they became personalized with uh, like the uh, uh, more Walkman form factor, right? So uh, uh, of having audio devices that you actually rent uh, at the museum's desk and then uh, you walk around and have a personalized experience. Um, since the 1990s, there have been actually research uh, projects on audio augmented reality, so for uh, Navigation for the Blind, for example. Uh, my colleague Jack Loomis uh, uh, at uh, UCSB uh, uh, has done very pioneering work uh, uh, since the early 1990s uh, in this space. And it has been used for workplace communication and uh, uh, enhancement of um, uh, like relationships uh, in an office uh, uh, scenario. This was Xerox Park work uh, where they kind of um, uh, envisioned the, uh, the, the future of uh, uh, collaboration in an office space via like uh, personalized audio messages. So considerations for audio augmented reality is how do you get the audio to personalize to one person? Like earphones, then you have the danger of blocking off the physical world. Augmented reality is all about overlay. So you want to have hear through um, uh, this um, uh, speakers, right, ideally. Um, so what uh, the HoloLens does, for example, is uh, a near-ear speaker array um, that kind of gives you the ability of spatialized sound uh, with uh, sort of hear-through uh, audio. And uh, another consideration for audio is uh, um, how do you actually spatialize the sound? So spatializing sound uh, means making it appear as if a certain sound source comes from a particular geometric space in the real world, right? And you can do that. There's good research on how to do that really well. Um, the best way to do that is actually to have um, a uh, personalized measured transfer function called an HRTF, head-related transfer function, um, because our ears and the geometry of our head and ears play such an important role in how the audio actually reverberates around um, our heads and uh, makes us perceive uh, the audio as coming from a certain source. Uh, so it's not one size fits all. But you don't want with an augmented reality display that you maybe just rent out for an hour, like uh, have a uh, uh, extended period of measuring one person's uh, um, like body. Right? So you have to kind of fit uh, and find a middle ground of uh, um, maybe taking the average of uh, uh, a certain demographic that is likely to appear for your demo or whatever it is, uh, and uh, uh, making it work uh, without too many uh, um, uh, measurements that you have to do uh, on a personal basis. Um, haptics is uh, much harder. So uh, uh, using forces uh, to uh, um, uh, overlay them on the physical world requires uh, uh, some kind of um, like uh, constraining hardware, right? So this is a, a very small uh, work area a haptic device called the Phantom. Um, 
that is here in, in this video actually coupled with uh, a visual augmented reality because uh, you could like uh, just assume that you have uh, um, a uh, uh, an instrument in your hand and you don't actually want to see that uh, haptic device that uh, exerts the force that uh, uh, makes it appear as if your pen actually now hits a uh, um, uh, a vase that you're painting on or something like that, right? So you want to, the pen to stop, you want to feel the haptic feedback, but you don't want to see the device that actually causes that to happen. So you can use visual augmented reality to have this device be blended into the background or completely disappear. Um, but this is a very small workspace, uh, um, a device like this. Um, so what do you do for walking around? Well, the options are you could put an exoskeleton on somebody, right? So you, you, you have a, an, a body armor that actually has motors and uh, exerts forces. It can also play the opposite force and help you lift uh, really ha heavy things, so making you like uh, uh, have Superman kind of powers. Um, or Wonder Woman kind of powers, uh, latest uh, movie. Um, and uh, uh, the other possibilities on a cheaper scale and a less intrusive scale are just like taking a, uh, a smaller approach to it, just putting pager motors on, uh, onto your hands, onto your uh, um, like, uh, body with a vest, for example. People have done that tap yourself on the shoulder uh, for a signal, but it doesn't give you the, uh, uh, the feeling of bumping into a door or something like that. So realistic haptic force is definitely a frontier. Uh, and it's more likely to happen in virtual reality first, uh, where you are already kind of constrained and uh, like hooked into one uh, stationary environment. So to do that with mobile augmented reality, very, very hard. And on the uh, um, olfactory and gustatory front, so that's smell and, uh, um, uh, and uh, taste, uh, they, there have been augmented reality experiences demonstrated, uh, especially uh, uh, um, by Japanese researchers. Uh, Japanese governments uh, uh, gladly supports like novel device uh, um, research uh, in domains such as this. Here's a, a one that uh, I experienced at a augmented reality uh, um, research conference uh, um, a few years ago. You, uh, uh, you had a vanilla cookie with a marker baked onto it or painted onto it or whatever uh, uh, way you would want it. And uh, you would have this uh, visual olfactory AR display which uh, actually like uh, um, channeled uh, um, aromas to your nose and changed your uh, uh, vision via video see-through. So what you're really eating was a vanilla cookie, but it looked like a chocolate cookie and it smelled like a chocolate cookie, so it tasted like a chocolate cookie. And that really works. So uh, um, you, can, you can demonstrate this uh, in, in controlled research experiments, uh, like smell and visual appearance uh, will give you the expression uh, or at least bias you into that direction. So uh, uh, this is an example of, of, of merging modalities uh, uh, in AR displays. But for the rest of this presentation, I will focus on visual displays because that is the predominant research uh, uh, area and the predominant uh, current commercial applicability arena. Um, so see-through displays uh, are um, easily grouped into like these three, two or three uh, um, main um, segments. So one, you have uh, see-through displays. They can be either handheld or a uh, uh, head-worn. Um, but if they're see-through, meaning that your eyes actually look through some medium that makes the uh, augmentation happen, then there's two options for that. One, it could be optically see-through, which means that you actually perceive the physical world uh, unmediated. You see it just through some transparent, possibly transparent uh, uh, medium. And you additionally have some overlays. But 
you actually see the physical world as it is, as you would normally do with your very eyes. Or you can see the physical world mediated through some camera or a set of cameras. There could be two cameras for stereo, there could be uh, even more cameras for uh, like a, a light field uh, um, uh, kind of reconstruction. Um, but in that case, we would classify this or group this under video see-through, because you see the world completely mediated through video that you actually take of the physical world, and then you can overlay uh, um, computer graphics on top of that video. Now, this made it sound like uh, I'm classifying uh, light field displays with video see-through, which is not quite right. You can do light field displays definitely in the optical uh, uh, domain as well. Okay. Yes. Could you give the state of the art on both these cases? I think uh, it will come in, 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 in upcoming slides. And then uh, the, the third way is uh, very different from the other two. So instead of a see-through display, we're now adding uh, computer graphics on top of the physical uh, uh, environment. And that is uh, sometimes referred to as projection-based display. Sometimes it's referred to as spatial augmented reality, or SAR. Um, and uh, it works by uh, um, having a projector that actually uh, uh, from outside puts uh, uh, computer generated content on top of uh, uh, an existing geometry. So you'll see all this. So this is not the only slide where I actually go over this. Um, well, all of these displays, whatever the technology is, have uh, lots of different requirements and characteristics that sets them apart in terms of uh, uh, what works well and what doesn't work so well for certain technologies. We already talked about the method of augmentation. That was the previous slide. Then there's the question of, uh, are you actually serving both eyes or just one? Um, if you're serving both eyes, there's still the question of uh, if you're actually introducing stereoscopy, meaning making it appear that there is some depth in the virtual content, right? So by just uh, introducing a slight shift of the left image that goes to your right eye and the right image that goes to your left eye so that you actually fuse it in your brain as a 3D uh, uh, picture. There's the question of uh, uh, is the display allowing you to uh, change your focus, not just on the physical uh, um, environment, but also on the, uh, uh, on the virtual uh, content. That's a big uh, boundary right now in the uh, active, uh, active field of development. Then there's the question of occlusion. Does occlusion work in all directions? Um, can virtual occlude uh, physical? Can physical occlude virtual? Um, and uh, we'll look into that. It's brightness and contrast, resolution and refresh rate. The field of view, which really made the news with the HoloLens, which is successful in so many dimensions, but not in field of view, right? So it's very limited in field of view, uh, which becomes very apparent. Uh, and even the examples there showed uh, lie, because it actually shows the camera uh, uh, view frustum, which is wider than what you actually see optical, uh, optically when you, uh, uh, when you wear the display. Then there's the question of uh, uh, a possible viewpoint offset. Um, this especially comes into play when you're wearing a video see-through display. It could be that uh, outside of your display, you have a slightly different uh, um, like perception of the reality than within the display, even though probably the display makers would try to, to keep it uh, smooth and uh, um, consistent. There's latency, so spatial uh, misregistration. So this again is uh, especially true for uh, uh, video see-through displays that could introduce a lag from what happens till you actually see it through the uh, video see-through display, which always like caused me to say, who will ever want to wear a video see-through display if that is a distinct possibility? Uh, would you cross a street uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you could think that there's some latency between the oncoming car that you see and uh, where it really is? Um, so you better make sure that uh, latency is uh, absolutely minimal. Uh, and there's lots of great research that really jump-started the, jump the field of virtual reality on latency reduction. 
Uh, in augmented reality, if anything, it's mo even more important to have uh, uh, low latency, because otherwise you see, uh, um, you do maybe don't get sick uh, as much, but uh, you see a, a, a wild uh, um, registration error between your overlays and, uh, uh, and the physical environment. And then huge, these, these uh, last two points, uh, distortions and aberrations are another interesting point, but I want to focus on the last two points real quick. Like, what's the form factor? We already talked about this. This is maybe the biggest uh, um, roadblock uh, on this place right now. Um, like, yeah, they are cool, but if they're heavy and clunky, uh, people will not wear them all the time. And augmented reality really could be an all the time kind of interface uh, possibility. It really could be. I mean, that is the vision, right? So that is the trajectory out there. But for that to happen, it would have to be a form factor that is socially acceptable and doesn't uh, bog you down. All right, so now the, the, the quick explanation of these, uh, these, uh, these three different possibilities. So optical see-through. This is the simplest uh, uh, depiction of an optical see-through display. Just imagine an uh, optical combiner like a beam split mirror. This is just a, uh, a semi-transparent uh, one-sided mirror, uh, right? So this mirror uh, on this side actually does mirror in this image coming from above directly to the eye, but it's also semi-transparent so that uh, the user sees the real world coming through from this side. So that means that the uh, uh, computer-generated image is kind of ghosted in and overlaid on top of uh, um, what the person sees. So this is just a very uh, simplistic way of implementing this, but the first uh, um, uh, displays were actually just that. They were a slanted, uh, half-mirrored piece of uh, um, glass. And uh, um, so this has become quite a bit more elaborate with waveguides and so on and so forth. But the basic principle is, is still the same, uh, that uh, you see the physical world coming through and then somehow you mirror in, literally, uh, the, the virtual information. Um, so you also have a post sensor here because you do want to uh, um, like, uh, uh, register the computer graphics with the physical world. And uh, you need something, right? You either need a camera that allows you to do a, a computer vision tracking and registration, or you need um, uh, sensors that uh, measure your head orientation or, uh, and head position. OK, so uh, the video see-through display, on the other hand, uh, works like this. Um, so instead of uh, the see-through um, like element, you now are looking into a, uh, a screen, into a uh, like opaque screen. But the screen is made non-opaque or see-through by actually also having cameras out in the other direction and then feeding that uh, camera image through a uh, digital combiner where the augmentation happens back into your display. And now you're seeing the world mediated through the camera. And that introduces like a, um, a slight difference in uh, vantage point, slight difference in uh, uh, field of view, because you're now slave to what the camera can support. So it, it introduces a lot of uh, um, elements that could distort your uh, view of the physical world. And the temporal aspect is really, really important, as I pointed out before. So you suddenly have the possibility of latency there, which is dangerous, right? But you still need the post sensors. Or again, you rely on computer vision to uh, uh, determine the six degree of freedom, which means position and orientation. So position x, y, and z is three, and then uh, you could uh, you could argue uh, um, your pitch and roll is uh, the three um, uh, uh, angles uh, um, for for orientation. So that's referred to as uh, six uh, degrees of freedom uh, uh, tracking of uh, a user's uh, head pose. Um, and then the third one is, uh, uh, works like this. So now you don't have to wear as much anymore. You are, uh, still may have to wear some sensors uh, to, that track you. You could have outside-in tracking. We talk about tracking in, uh, in the next session. Um, but uh, here, you, a, a projector uh, that actually is linked to a content generation system and is linked to cameras that actually observe any moving objects in the physical environment uh, project uh, kind of a layer on top of these uh, uh, physical devices. And so there are limitations there as well. If you're uh, 
if your scene is all white, then it works beautifully, right? And uh, in Disney theme parks, you have uh, good demos that uh, do that. There, there's a scene that has the geometry, and then any dynamic uh, uh, content on top of this is actually done with projection. Um, or it's also, I've seen these projection mapping uh, uh, um, outside shows where uh, you see like projections onto building fronts or, uh, uh, or other like big uh, uh, outdoor environments. Um, so the benefit here is no combiner unit is required, but the problem occurs when, when your texture of the real world is already very pronounced and uh, uh, cannot easily be negated with light, right? You can only add light, you cannot really subtract light. So, uh, um, or other way around. Well, no, no, so you can, obviously you're adding light, but, but if you have already uh, um, like a very, like a uh, uh, highly textured and highly colorful environment, it's very hard to, to bring this to an opposite color, right? Um, so, so here's uh, some examples of uh, non-see-through displays, right? Um, that uh, uh, really, this is all the examples here uh, um, uh, with uh, the DK2 and uh, the uh, Gear VR. Uh, this is actually, the Gear VR can be used in augmented reality mode because you can use the camera of uh, uh, the phone uh, and then see the world feed fed through uh, uh, the camera. And that works actually quite well. Um, optical see-through headsets uh, are really uh, um, like uh, more recent that they, uh, they, they have come to market. Right, so the HoloLens is uh, um, kind of still the, the the gold standard as the development kit out there right now. Um, you probably have all seen uh, different products. Maybe you got a demo of the uh, uh, Star Design Group uh, smart glasses. Uh, um, they're very nice. Uh, the Meta 2 is out in its development kit. The Dactree smart helmet is uh, uh, close to shipping. Um, so uh, uh, there is options around uh, for uh, um, different optical see-through displays. In our book, we, uh, we did the following uh, uh, brief taxonomy um, that uh, just grouped uh, uh, displays, see-through displays, uh, by uh, means of uh, being monocular or binocular, and then video see-through or optical see-through, and then uh, um, if video see-through, is it single camera or dual camera, and so, so all of these cases have some um, like uh, uh, implementations and incarnations. Um, it's uh, not the only way to, uh, to, to structure the space by far, um, but uh, yes. Yeah, th this would be outside the scope here. So a VR headset uh, would, would be uh, would be different, but could, if it is actually coupled with a camera, become a see-through display, right? So as uh, uh, the, the, the AR Rift, for example, a research project, and it's rumored that the next version uh, uh, of it actually will actually have cameras to, to oh, feed through. The Vive has a camera that's going out, so you can use it in, in augmented reality mode. Um, so, so they are uh, definitely binocular, right? So they are definitely stereo. Um, they are video see-through, so they would be, uh, they have only one single camera as far as we know right now, so the Vive would actually end up here. And it would, in terms of overlays, it can do stereoscopic overlays, so it would be right here. So that's where the Vive actually would, would end up. Can you explain what you mean by stereoscopic overlays? Yeah. So, uh, um, the graphics that you overlay on top of your, uh, um, in this case we were talking about video see-through, uh, could be separated out into a left eye view and a right eye view and therefore introduce parallax. So that is the um, distinction. So you can either keep it flat, in which case it's just a label that lives at your focus plane, but doesn't seem to have any other depth than the one depth that uh, the display manufacturer decides upon. But if you're introducing stereoscopy, uh, um, then you can make the virtual uh, object appear at any depth. The problem is that, uh, uh, so that this is a, a uh, effect that is only fused in your brain. And normally in the physical world, 
Let me actually go to that slide. That's my next slide, so it's, there we go. In the physical world, what happens is that your virgins, which means uh, where you look, looking uh, um, with your two eyeballs, right? So from the rotation of the eyeballs, is coupled with where your uh, um, uh, phys physical optical system, your, your own uh, lens system in your eyes, puts the focus plane. So you can adjust the focus as well. So you have muscles in your eyes that actually uh, make just one distance uh, um, be in focus, and then everything else is blurred out. So in, a nat in natural viewing, the virgins and the uh, um, focus are coupled all the time. It doesn't have to be. We can easily be dissuaded from coupling it. And in fact, I mean, any of you who have uh, watched any stereoscopic uh, movies in theaters or on your home TV for the brief period that they were successful for um, have decoupled it because these experiences bring in stereoscopic effects. But the focus is kept uh, like constant for the display environment that you were experiencing. That's true for all movie theaters right now or for home theaters. It's not true for uh, some emergent uh, VR, AR technologies. So that's another question. So why just example, you have a single camera. So how will you get like two images? So when you have a single camera, then you can't do stereoscopy, right? So if you go back to this uh, image, you will not see an example with a single camera and uh, a stereoscopic backdrop. But you still can give stereoscopic overlays. So you could have a flat appearing video that actually is just uh, the backdrop of your AR experience. And now because you have two displays, one for your left eye and your right eye, your overlays can still have depth and appear as if they are uh, uh, at different distances. But you would not see the physical world in stereo. So that's uh, what is this option, stereoscopic overlays but single camera. But if you have two cameras, then you can have also the physical world, stereoscopy. And stereoscopy, as I just mentioned, is may not be the best uh, way to go about this problem in the first place, right? Because of this problem that I was just uh, trying to explain. It is referred to as the accommodation virgins mismatch. That, uh, Normally, in physical viewing, the eyes accommodate and verge at the same distance. And now we disrupt this. In pretty much all current uh, um, AR and VR devices, we change this. We actually force users to decouple this. And it works, but people claim that it does give them like uh, a little bit discomfort, blurry vision, maybe a headache. And this is the niche market that uh, Magic Leap uh, actually claims to have their uh, innovation in, that uh, Avigent, Avigent uh, is, uh, uh, has uh, their light field display in, um, and several other research light field displays came out to address that problem. So, uh, um, does, does, with HoloLens, if you pin something on a wall, yes. like whatever you're viewing, right, if you go closer to it, you actually see a narrower version of that, like if you take a browser page. Yes. Yes. As you go up closer, now they're trying to stop you from uh, suffering from the avert, accommodation versus conflict. Is that right? So this is a different effect that you just uh, um, that you just uh, mentioned. So this is just uh, perspective foreshortening, and that's currently done really well, right? This effect of uh, the uh, accommodation versus. Yeah. Actually, a weird user experience. Of you. I, I yeah, I don't know exactly what effect you're, uh, you're referring to, okay. so um, maybe we can talk it, about it, that it offline. Narrow, it just narrows, like if you have a, a you know, on, on, you know, on, if you have a, a HoloLens and you actually watch the, an email or a browser page, it looks great from a certain distance, yeah. I don't know, 10, 15 meters. As you get closer to it, the, not necessarily the field of view, but actually what you see within the field of view narrows tremendously. And at first, yeah, and at first I thought it was a mistake, and then I thought they, they must be trying to... Well, there is definitely a field of view problem. So if you get really close to content and you have a narrow field of view, you have to scan the environment in order to see the object, right? 
with the display technology in the HoloLens, it would be possible to not have a foreshortening, to have the object appear uh, in the correct size all the time going backwards and forwards. So if that happened with a particular Im implementation of your demo, it could have been a software issue for that particular demo. Um, it is possible, so that's not the accommodation versions mismatch. The accommodation versions mismatch comes into play when focus uh, uh, is at the issue. So, and that means keeping things uh, like really sharp and other things at other distances blurry. And uh, um, normally that is linked with uh, uh, the perception of uh, um, virgins, of stereo, right, uh, of your eye rotation. Uh, but decoupled in many of the, the, the common uh, systems. However, there are light field displays that uh, uh, try to, to combat that. Um, so a light field display um, brings a reconstruction of the light space uh, that must be measured with all incoming angles for all incoming, uh, for all positions that you are interested in and actually play back the entire uh, distribution of light uh, for you. So it's a very hard problem. It's very computationally expensive and it's optically ch challenging. There's various implementations uh, uh, of it. So here's one, which is called the, uh, the pin light display prototype. So I had the, the, uh, um, uh, a virtual reality prototype, the same group. Uh, this was uh, Andrew Maimonis, uh PhD work at UNC Chapel Hill in co collaboration with NVIDIA. Um, so he actually right now is working at Microsoft Research and has recently come out, uh, this year it will come out as a research paper, uh, a holographic near eye display for virtual and augmented reality with a different approach of actually bringing in a light field display. Um, the uh, uh, issue just to, uh, to visualize this for you um, is probably best uh, explained with one of Magic Leap's videos where uh, um, you can see objects, physical and virtual, coming in and out of focus. So you have different planes. If you actually, your, virtual, your physical eyes focus on uh, the front, like the solar system right now, then the background, like this lady in the background, is actually blurry. If you focus on the lady, then the foreground, the physical object, here gets, uh, gets blurry in a second. Um, there you go, right? So a quick, for a quick uh, uh, time period, so now you have the, uh, the background in focus and uh, the foreground blurry. So this is not normally possible with uh, uh, augmented reality displays uh, that are not in some sense light field based, right? There's other ways of actually addressing this problem. You could uh, uh, bring in a, uh, um, a, a tunable lens that actually makes it possible, that is deformable, that uh, 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 gives you the ability of controlling the, uh, the focus plane. But in that case, you would need to measure your, your eye uh, direction with eye trackers very, very carefully and in real time. And all of that in an uh, um, integrated display is really not currently possible. So this nice table of uh, uh, listing the, the, the possibilities of near-eye displays that do enable these accommodative cues is from uh, 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 the best paper uh, um, award-winning uh, contribution of IEEE VR this year, like just a month ago, was in Los Angeles um, by uh, Dan and Edal, uh, a research collaboration between UNC and uh, uh, NVIDIA and Microsoft, I think. Um, and uh, um, so, so they had a work with a very focal uh, lens, and uh, uh, this was their entry. But there's other uh, displays that have been demonstrated in research. We don't know, uh, there's no um, details available, how the Magic Leap display works, or uh, I also have no uh, um, information about the Evergent light field uh, display. But they're all in the same spectrum um, of trying to solve this accommodation version mismatch and at the same time provide a very comfortable viewing experience with 3D content, uh, physical and, and uh, augmented merged. So a very interesting space. Um, so 
The next question that uh, comes in, and not all of these providers have that built in, right? It's a big uh, uh, like uh, research boundary by its, in its own right, is how to make uh, merge optical see-through with real occlusion. So uh, here's uh, an example of it from uh, Kiyoshi Kiyokawa's work. So this is what an optical see-through display would normally look like. So your, your imagery is, is just uh, mirrored onto the physical scene. And even though you know the physical uh, geometry, there's no way for you to actually hide these pixels because they're just mirrored in. There's no way to, um, uh, to by software, eliminate them, right? So you need to actually uh, build in um, like extra shutters, controllable uh, um, elements that allow you to uh, have the virtual completely occlude the physical. Mind you, the other way is easy, right? I can just make the physical um, uh, occlude the virtual by not rendering that part of my virtual. So I can do that in software. So that's super easy, right? I just need a model uh, of the environment, and I just, yeah, in this case, don't render the part from here to here. But this part, that one is really hard uh, with an optical see-through display. With a video see-through display, it comes for free. I can just replace the pixel that the camera sees. But with an optical see-through display, it's just blended in. So I actually need additional hardware. In this case, an LCD panel that shuts off the light from the outside, and uh, so you see a complete occlusion there, complete black. Uh, and so the, the graphics actually occlude this. So a hard problem to integrate that into a, a, a display as well. So that's what's going on. All these, these techniques, light field displays, occlusion masks, and then tracking need to be integrated into an augmented reality headset. Yes? So ideally, I mean, this is done uh, via real-time sensing and tracking. Uh, so we, we will have a whole session on tracking and how accurate that currently is. Uh, um, so some of the devices out there do a really good job, like the HoloLens, but it has its limitations. Um, so maybe if you, it depends on the application, right? Sometimes you can afford to scan something before. We had this, this great question uh, um, after the first session where maybe there are applications right now where you don't need the holy grail of uh, doing everything in real time uh, automatically. Maybe you can afford to get away with uh, pre-sensing, pre-model uh, um, uh, building and in, in certain environments. But it depends so much on your environment, right? But uh, the goal is definitely to do all this uh, um, on the fly. So here's another example, I think, a video of, uh, of this occlusion working. So in this case, uh, you have the occlusion. In this case, it's hard to see, but it is uh, um, uh, It is still, well, at least both. Maybe it's just left eye, right eye. So of occluded. All right, so here's an image quality comparison. Uh, so we mocked up the, uh, some examples. Uh, actually, this, uh, this picture uh, is, is coming from uh, uh, like Dieter's house, where there is a, uh, um, uh, a uh, veterinarian praxis in the basement um, that his wife runs. And uh, uh, you, uh, you can actually see uh, an example of optical see-through where we exaggerated the resolution problems. So here, the overlaid part uh, of uh, the pincers here uh, are um, low resolution, but they show you where uh, a tumor is located and where you would need to, uh, to find a grip. Um, in video see-through, the whole image would be affected by resolution problems, right? Because now everything is mediated by the camera. So not just the overlay. And the overlay could be completely uh, um, uh, opaque, whereas here 
it's actually just uh, um, like ghosted on top of the existing image. So there's actually different uh, uh, pros and cons to these different technologies. Um, this is uh, an illustration of maybe one of the biggest curses uh, that uh, uh, displays uh, suffer right now, and, and that is like a small field of view. Um, so the whole lens particularly has a very small overlay field of view of about 30 by 17 uh, degrees. So around this is a whole like segment where you see the physical world because it's an optical see-through display, but you don't see any overlays. So in AR terms, you would see a peripheral field of view and then just a very small, um, comparatively small uh, uh, square in the middle of your vision. Luckily, that's the most important part of your vision because that's where you uh, have like mostly focus and where you have most of your attention and the highest acuity too. And uh, uh, that's where the overlay actually happens. And if the important part falls outside of this uh, um, overlay field of view, you have to scan and look for it, right? Because otherwise you don't get the benefit of AR. And we are also interested in what side effects this uh, um, field of view constraint might, might bring with it. So we're doing a research in my lab that simulates different field of view uh, uh, conditions. So we have this uh, three-story uh, um, uh, virtual uh, visualization chamber. So it's basically, it looks a little bit like Cerebro. Uh, it's like a, a bridge in the middle, um, uh, projection all around, sound all around. And so we, uh, we put um, a uh, panorama of, uh, a stereo panorama of the Luxor Temple as the backdrop that is our reality, so we simulate that. And now we can layer on top of that um, like simulated augmented reality. And like scenes where you would have like these leader lines uh, that overlay your entire field of regard are not even currently envisioned yet as an augmented reality uh, application because the field of view normally is so small as we simulate here um, that you normally just do like single labels or point of points of interest. But imagine what you could do if your entire field of vision would be uh, augmented. Right, this is what we want to um, kind of uh, uh, experience here and test uh, the consequences of. So, uh, so we can, with head tracked uh, um, stereo goggles, we can actually simulate any field of view. We can simulate any uh, uh, latency because um, uh, this is actually a stationary display. So by default, it has zero latency if you just walk around and keep everything stable. But we can slave it to the head motion and actually introduce some to, to see the effects of it. And so we run studies in there to see what field of view you would need to, uh, um, to get certain uh, uh, performance boosts in augmented reality. And so for a task like this, where you would follow lines from a physical object to a virtual annotation, uh, it turns out that there's a sweet spot at about 60 to 75 degrees uh, field of view, which is much, much farther what the, than what the HoloLens has. The Meta 2 comes uh, uh, quite close to it in terms of uh, the field of view, but they're lagging behind in other uh, areas of technology development to the HoloLens. So, so very interesting things that you can do uh, uh, in augmented reality simulation here. So here's a, a registration uh, illustration, right? So you actually clearly want to have uh, a really accurate registration because otherwise your, uh, your visuals look like this. And you can probably still work with this, right? Uh, even if your overlays like, uh, are not exactly dead on, they are probably, when they move around, close enough that you can still get some benefit, but it could be very distracting. And it is a, uh, um, a field of further study as to how much a misregistration would affect your health and your performance in certain tasks, right? With computer vision uh, algorithms and video see-through displays, pixel accurate matching is actually much easier to obtain. Also because you can buy yourself some time in this temporal domain. You can use some of the latency that already comes with the camera feed coming to your uh, display to uh, do computer vision at the same time. Okay, so image displacement uh, I, I mentioned as one other problem. So uh, uh, one drastic example is to not even wear a display but see the overlays uh, at a uh, 
different monitor, right? So you can do augmented reality experiences like this. Uh, this also goes back to the question, what can we do if we don't have a, a perfect headset yet? You can work with uh, existing displays, but you have to kind of uh, live with this decoupling of uh, the, the scene that is shown and uh, um, uh, where it is actually recorded. So here's a, a brightness comparison between optical see-through and video see-through. And again, it's much exaggerated. So optical see-through uh, um, depends on the transparency of the optical combiner and makes everything darker, right? Whereas uh, video see-through very much uh, is limited by the, uh, um, uh, the, the contrast uh, and, and brightness uh, abilities of your, uh, um, of your camera. So high dynamic range does not like, really survive well in video see-through. Uh, we don't have good high dynamic range imaging devices yet. Uh, but our eyes are very high dynamic range, right? And they can adapt too. I mean, just imagine like uh, coming from a very bright sunlit day into a, um, uh, a dim church. And uh, you can actually see uh, um, detail um, uh, here as well. So I just get noticed that we have noon right now. We, I am pretty much uh, through with, uh, yeah, I'll finish up really quickly with, uh, with the display slides. And then we go to, um, so you're suggesting, OK, well. Yeah, or tracking. Um, so failure is uh, obviously a, a real hard problem. Uh, I said you wouldn't want to cross the street if there's any danger of delay. Even worse, if there's any fa uh, change of failure of your augmented reality see-through display while you're crossing the street, then uh, I mean, you don't see anything anymore, and you definitely get hit by the car. So it's very dangerous. <laughs> So uh, there's different form factors, right? So uh, um, helmet mounted, clip on, uh, a, a visor kind of display. There's different uh, um, distances from the eye that uh, display technologies work. There's the head sp uh, space with near eye displays. There's the body space with handheld displays. And there's the world space with the more um, uh, spatial uh, augmented reality projective dis displays. So there's some optical see-through examples. Um, early ones like the Sony Glastron, the Microvision Nova, uh, then uh, um, the technologies for see-through displays. And this is uh, also similar to, to what the HoloLens does. This is uh, a technology by Lumos in this case, uh, propagating an image through, through a special optical prism. We are so-called waveguides. So I told you that it was like a fancy version of the image mirrored in via a normal beam splitter. And that's exactly what it is, but much, much more complicated uh, um, optics. In fact, the optics can contain holographic elements. That doesn't mean that the uh, output of them is a holography. Holography in a technical term is actually very uh, um, well defined. It's a uh, uh, laser induced lighting on a photographic surface that uh, 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 appears from the same light that actually kept the, constructed the environment, is used to, to shine on the surface uh, uh, on the photographic plate to actually make it appear again. Now, none of the uh, um, uh, displays that we have out there right now in augmented reality are truly holographic in that sense. But holog holography has actually morphed its meaning to now just mean mixed reality in general, okay? But there is actually a hologram in some of these uh, um, like optical designs, uh, but the hologram just has the uh, um, purpose of uh, um, like bending the light and scattering the light and uh, reflecting the light. But it doesn't mean that the resulting image is a hologram in this sense as well. All right, so one last thing to uh, uh, introduce here, and that's uh, actually a link to the tracking uh, segment that you will see next. And that's the spatial model of AR displays that we uh, uh, introduce in our book. So there's lots of uh, reference frames and uh, transformations that you need to uh, be aware of uh, when designing augmented reality uh, experiences. The world uh, has a, a, a um, a coordinate system, objects have one, camera has one, displays have one, and the eye, the observer has one. And so these are uh, um, different um, uh, transformations between these elements can be either constant or calibrated, we uh, label it via C, or tracked 
and we label it via a T, or not constrained, and then we don't have a, a line um, uh, altogether at all. And uh, uh, any display in the space can be then represented as a little diagram uh, like this. Uh, that references which ones of these relationships are fixed in what way. So we have examples for optical see-through, video see-through, which is much more complicated. You see the camera is tracked with respect to the world, the eye is calibrated with respect to the display, and the camera is calibrated with respect to the uh, display as well. <coughs> so we have one more type of display where a user is actually wearing a projector and uh, you see um, the, uh, the world uh, augmented with uh, the content that comes from this projector. So here these helmets, this is work from uh, University of South, uh, Southern California, ICT. Um, two users are looking at the same scene with uh, a uh, um, screen that has a retroreflective material. Retroreflective material is something that you know from uh, um, like uh, uh, traffic, like traffic signs uh, actually reflect back to the car in exactly the same uh, uh, incident angle, right? So instead of uh, scattering it with the same angle, it coming back to where it's actually uh, uh, being lit from. So in this case, uh, two people are looking at this and shooting their projectors, they are mounted on helmets onto the surface, and an image is coming back to them that they produced and they see their own version of this image. So this uh, uh, soldier here can look and face and behave differently for two onlookers, okay? So that's the benefit of, uh, of this technology. Handheld displays, user perspective handheld displays, which are very hard to implement. Uh, this is a research project that Domogoj Boricevic in my uh, lab has done over the last four years. Um, I won't have time to go into this. And then spatial augmented reality, I already mentioned, this is just a uh, um, passive block, but you can make it appear as if it's an uh, old-fashioned TV, right, by just projecting onto it. So you can make uh, the spatial augmented reality view dependent as well by projecting onto it with imagery that is dependent on where the user is located. And if they're always looking at a physical uh, environment, they can even make it appear as if the virtual object floats in uh, mid-space. So you might think with spatial augmented reality, you're limited to just uh, um, putting textures on physical environments, but now you can actually also make it appear as, as uh, that virtual images are floating in mid-space. So uh, you can introduce uh, like uh, occlusion with spatial augmented reality as well. Uh, and you can have dynamic uh, uh, elements with, the, with uh, these technologies as well. And these projectors can be steerable so that they actually uh, follow the objects that they're projecting upon around. So you can even project onto your hand. There was a research project uh, from Microsoft Research uh, previously. This is IBM Research. And that's my display segment. So what's the plan? It is now 12.09. Okay, so we have Q&A on this segment and then lunch break and we do tracking after lunch after all. So that's probably a, a, a better idea since we're already going over a little bit. So that's a wise middle ground that uh, lunch will be at 12.30. All right, so any questions uh, um, on both of these segments, so, but particularly uh, the display technologies that uh, uh, I went over really um, over the last hour, so. What kind of frame rate and Okay, frame rates and uh, uh, resolutions. Um, so the frame rate is, uh, is kind of an independent question, right? So the frame rate is the same as for virtual reality. So there's, no, uh, um, there's no other limiting factor there. Resolution, I think there is definitely a, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the problem of the, optical, the optics. Um, so, resolution, what is, what is typical? Well, I mean, one thing with optical see-through that you, that you can't do is uh, have s things like optical elements that are used in the uh, Oculus uh, consisting of simple magnification optics because then you will also see the real world magnified. Uh, so if you don't want that, 
uh, then you're going to be constrained by the relationship of optical elements like lenses and the display form factor that you can produce. So yeah. typically the uh, resolutions um, are, qu are quite a bit lower than yeah. for VR. Um, so so if, if you have a, fa a factor of two times uh, resolution increase through magnification optics in the Oculus headset, I, I guess, yeah, I haven't verified it, then that would be a, f uh, a fourfold increase in, uh, in perceived resolution compared to uh, not having that in a see-through display, optical see-through display. So with things like, uh, uh, so with the HoloLens having such a small field of view, I mean, you don't need as much resolution for that small field of view either, right? So, so that's another benefit in some sense for, uh, uh, for, for, for having that small field of view. I mean, one is actually the problem of getting an optical see-through display uh, in that form factor that is wider and the expense of it. But the other one is actually the, uh, the, the resolution um, uh, problem. So you can get away with... Uh, uh, with 1280 by 1024 resolution uh, for augmented reality experiences very easily. So it's not as high as uh, VR. And what is the state of art in VR headset? Twice uh, 1920 by uh, 1600, right? Like, yeah, they're uh, trying to go higher now. Yeah, but 4K even. Yeah. 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 One of the things to consider, though, is that if you only plan on having sparse overlays from augmented reality, then maybe the resolution of the virtual part of the display is not so much your concern because the reality has infinite resolution per definition. And, uh, you know, if you only want transparent overlays that are primarily text or simple glyphs, then that could be okay. So maybe it's not as sensitive. But then if you go into gaming, then of course it hurts. Huh? And with video yeah. see-through, you're very much limited by, uh, by resolution. Uh, in fact, I mean, there's great video see-through uh, uh, headsets around right now. Um, uh, so I've just seen uh, um, some recent demos at IEEE VR. But the further away the objects are, the, the more you notice how limiting that resolution of the camera is, right? So, and there are not now cameras that can stream in real time uh, at VR resolutions. So, so that's a real problem for video see-through uh, uh, AR. So it's more the camera, not the display in the video see-through? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, in the video see-through, I think the limits are much more on the camera right now. In, in particular, the bandwidth streaming the video off the camera to the, you know, to the main system and the display, because it has to be with low latency. You cannot afford encoding, so you're very much bandwidth limited. There are high frame rate cameras that store directly onto internal memory at 200 hertz, but this is not what you can get here. And the, on the optical part, I think you said that given the field of view is small on the augmented, the yeah. piece, resolution isn't a big... Isn't yeah. as important, but so you will hit it. If you were to just take the, the, the virtual part of the augmented or uh, the overlay part, um, you said something like 1K by 1K, right? Uh, and compare that to a 2K by 2K virtual reality, Experience is the same. Oh, yeah, in terms of density, yeah, I would say so. So uh, pixel density uh, um, is, is probably uh, very close to each other there. Um, but since you have the physical world, you're not going to be as distracted by resolution artifacts, right? Because the physical world will, will look perfect, as Dieter pointed out. So in virtual reality, you will notice the resolution artifacts much more. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's interesting. It's really different in terms of uh, your perception of, uh, uh, of what's, what the, the, the final experience is. There was another question yeah, there. I'm trying to understand the advantages and use cases of video see-through AR. Yeah. I mean, I mean, is it really that the fact that you can combine it well and you don't need the tracking and the slam as well? Is that the real benefit? And then you're hopeful, hopeful it's just a real-life real um, it just seems a little contrived. The other benefit is that you see um, like uh, the entire scene, or benefit, I don't know if it is a benefit, but it is definitely a, a characteristic, that you see the, scene, the, the whole scene like uh, without this, this overlay field of view, right? It's still, it's still a limited field of view, but you don't have this difference uh, between like a part that is yeah. overlaid and another part that is I'm not. The entire image is actually overlaid. 
So, so there are some distinct use cases. Everybody knows the, the thermal goggles that the Navy SEALs wear. That is basically a video see-through augmented reality of some sort, only with a direct, you know, video processing as the... Not, not infrared, right? Whatever. You have some kind of camera, you do something to the image, and then you present it in a video see-through display uh, that could or could not include purely virtual elements. Um, and uh, if you look into any kind of telepresence application, uh, then a conventional virtual reality headset could be turned into a video see-through only for a remote location. Yeah? So I don't think uh, we will completely abandon the video see-through mode. Yeah? Uh, only that I also do not expect that people will be wearing video see-through on the street. That doesn't seem likely either. Yes. Uh, could you expound a little bit more on your sweet spot of 60 to 75 degrees? Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, uh, you, you have to take this uh, really with a grain of salt because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, our uh, um, surmise is uh, that, that it will very much depend on a uh, particular application. So the only thing that we've tested here is uh, this particular application of, uh, following seeing information in this space. So this is the overview in a, in a slightly distorted view, um, where there's physical objects like these statues in the Luxor Temple, and then li linked uh, uh, lines to virtual information like a map and a, uh, um, uh, an overview of uh, art historic information from books. That's linking books two particular uh, uh, statues, and these statues are linked to the physical thing. And now we ask the users questions of uh, which statue uh, uh, of Ramses uh, depicts him with uh, um, his two kids or whatever. And it's actually list, the answer is listed here, so you have to find it first in the uh, uh, art historic uh, um, panel, and then it will lead you to the actual statue, and then you key in your answer and we time that. Okay. so. We contrived this task because we wanted to have something that uh, requires uh, overlays that span your entire field of regard. There is really no ex experience like that, but I can give you a few other examples for which that may be useful. An architect is standing in front of a uh, augmented uh, version of their building, and they're standing in the um, uh, construction site where it's going to be built, or maybe the, the plain meadow, uh, and it's not even broken ground yet. And uh, they want to see the, the, the house in its full glory, uh, and they want to maybe even be able to step into the house and see the real world shining through the windows. So now your augmented reality has to be full field of regard because uh, virtual reality has to take over most of your field of vision and only the windows would actually leave the light from the physical reality back in. So that's just an application scenario to motivate why you would want to have um, uh, uh, like full field of regard. Now the 60 to 80 or 75 uh, um, uh, sweet spot is uh, comes from the following experiment. We, we vary the, uh, um, the field uh, of view of our simulated augmented reality d d display, which is showing you like, uh, uh, like a different sized overlaid field of view. We started small, and then we had bigger and bigger sizes. And we saw a tapering off of performance as measured by the time that it took them to answer these questions about these uh, um, observations in this uh, 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 art history Luxor temple scenario at around 60 and, uh, to, to 75 degrees. Below that, they were slower and made more mistakes because they had to look around more and scan the environment more. Beyond that, uh, they didn't get a real benefit anymore, but just on this task. So take it really with a, a, a grain of salt. We don't have uh, evidence, scientific evidence, for generalizable task yet. More questions? Yes? Yeah, um, so quite a while back I read an article I think it was in Wired Magazine about uh, a guy who was born uh, with no whole vision and then in his youth because of an accident he lost vision in one eye and then later in life he's another accident he lost vision in his other eye. 
And so researchers were able to electrically stimulate the external of the brain to induce uh, black and white PGA quality images. Um, what, I mean, do you have any comments about that? So that would be in our future of AR segment. Because, uh, no, I mean, it's perfectly legit. This is uh, yet another display. Um, it's direct brain interfaces, and it's definitely uh, um, uh, one of the possibilities that I haven't covered in the display section because it's, it's actually, it is possible in isolated cases in research right now, but really commercial applicability or something like that is, is far off. We, we don't understand enough about the, uh, um, uh, the structure of our brains to reliably actually do something like this without harming uh, a, a patient inadvertently. But uh, yes, so um, I mean, if you take uh, uh, like science fiction, right, you, you have examples of, uh, of all these displays and the matrix would be the one that you actually uh, uh, propose, like giving a reconstruction or really virtual uh, realization of the physical world directly stimulating your brain. Yeah, so, so one of the things with the EEG uh, is that there, there is not yet an HDMI plug in the back of our neck and uh, the, the, you can only produce high quality sensations if you are invasive. If you try to do it just with electrical stimulation through the skull, uh, you get very limited results and that is sort of a fundamental problem that is not so easy to... Do you know, really quick comment on that, so yeah. the, the, the opposite of that is also research that you, you may uh, uh, be familiar with, uh, um, uh, researchers at, uh, was it Berkeley? Was it Berkeley or Stanford? Um, uh, with machine learning and video input and EEG, right, re re represented uh, the stimulus uh, uh, of people seeing new videos from YouTube uh, and image that just from the brain response. So you could actually see these ghostly images of somebody who is watching an, uh, a video reconstructed. Uh, and uh, so this is basically an, uh, an application in the future. You could, uh, you could hope to use similar technology to, to, to display uh, uh, people's dreams while they're experiencing them, right? So and that happened a few years ago and actually uh, like made it to the news in big inception. time too. Yes? So I think uh, it will more and more uh, take into account uh, what we know about the psychology and the physiopsychology of, uh, of, of our uh, sensory systems. An example of where it is taken into account is uh, uh, foveated rendering, where, uh, so this is in VR, but can also be applied to AR, where uh, you actually save yourself processing power because you are, uh, um, uh, you, you represent the, uh, the wider periphery uh, uh, of your imagery in a more approximate form because we know that that is not where we actually uh, uh, can see sharp differences anyway. So in this sense, uh, uh, the more we know about uh, the psychology and the physio, physio psychology of our, our systems, the more we can do. Um, uh, there's definitely a, a big field uh, emerging on uh, um, like uh, taking more of these, this knowledge into account for AR experiences. But at the moment, we are still in the early stages where it's more technolog te technologically driven. I, I, I say that's, that's, that's fair to say. Yes. I have a question on that. Yeah. So when we talk about depth cameras, we always talk about two cameras mimicking the left and right eye, and you know, they are doing the slightly uh, triangulation. Yeah. yeah. But my question is, how come we are able to see depth even if I go one eye? Ah, yeah, very good question. So we have uh, we have lots of uh, um, uh, depth cues. You can enumerate them. Uh, uh, the biggest depth cue probably is a monocular depth cue is occlusion. I mean, if something occludes something else, we know it's in front of this, uh, something else. There's just no other resolution for us. Uh, we don't live in a world where, where that is violated. Um, so there is lots. There, there are lots of monocular depth cues, but uh, um, uh, stereos stereoscopy is interesting. Uh, um, uh, 
it's actually interesting from the point of view that, that there's 10% or 8% of the population that do, don't actually experience it. There's, there's, there's 8% who have some kind of uh, um, uh, vision impairment that they may not be even uh, uh, aware about that would preclude them from seeing stereo in, in the sense that uh, you get a different image to the left and right eye. But yet they would say, of course I see 3D from all these other depth cues and they are actually primed much better to use these other depth cues to a to, to better extent. Now, the, the stereo movies uh, that uh, use shutter glasses or, or polarization glasses actually, uh, um, they just use stereoscopy. So there is 8% of the population that didn't get that effect. And that wasn't actually well advertised to them. So I'm sure lots of people actually find, found out because of that, that, that they are among that, uh, that 8%. Um, so in terms of AR, you should use all the, the, the depth cues for sure. Um, there's a lot of focus on uh, Well, if you, have, if you have light field reconstruction, then you're actually sidestepping the issue because stereoscopy is kind of an approximation of that anyway. So the light field is the full physical experience of representing the light incoming and being reflected from all possible points in the physical environment. So if you do that correct and fully accurate, it is the physical environment, right? So you cannot get better than that. Um, and it would actually simulate all of the monocular uh, um, cues as well. There's other monocular cues, uh, like, uh, for example, depth of field. Like uh, something further back is more hazy because we have partic uh, participating media in the, uh, in, in the air between here. And so uh, uh, it becomes more grayed out and uh, more monotone in colors. So you see that uh, particularly in the mountains where the uh, mountain ranges in the back become more washed out and, and lighter colors of gray. So there's lots of them. So my follow-up question, so how come depth systems today cannot work with a single camera? Why do they need both, both two of them? Following, following the human eye example, why can't the system be designed with just one camera? Oh, all right, via computer vision. That's, a, that's actually a fair question. But we, we should separate out uh, um, uh, different things here. So the, uh, a depth camera uh, could actually work differently from stereoscopy completely, right? So it could be... Uh, an infrared pattern projected, invisible to yeah. our eyes, onto the physical scene, and the second camera actually just uh, interprets the pattern. That is a different depth view, and it is in, in use, so it's not using stereoscopy. I think most depth cameras do not use stereoscopy. In fact, uh, um, uh, time of flight is an important, we, we will actually cover this in a tracking yeah. session just, uh, just after lunch. Um, the, all these technologies will be listed uh, in the next session. But time of flight works by uh, having a, uh, a laser or something else uh, being shot out into the scene and reflected back and uh, timing the, uh, the time that it takes to, to actually come back to your, to, to your eye. And uh, um, by, by this return flight, you actually can calculate the distance. So that's obviously not making use of stereoscopy. So it is other uh, cues are being used. It is still a very difficult problem to have 3D scene recognition in computer vision just from shape, shading, and texture. That's three, that's three uh, depth cues right there and active research areas, and they're not perfect at all to, to calculate depth from those alone. So, so just to make this clear, because this is kind of implicit uh, in, in your question, there, there is, depth is, you know, not, not a well-defined term. Do you mean depths for a single point? Because uh, uh, computer vision does depth point by point depth computation in a very low level naive way. This is not what our brain does. Our brain does uh, depth estimation on an object basis where you have to introduce the notion, notion of an object. So for example, I know that the person is about uh, six feet, and uh, if I see a teeny tiny image of a person, then that must be a person far away. But first I have to recognize that this is in fact a person, which is something that a computer vision system can also do. Um, but this is not how you would normally, uh, you know, use depths in a computer vision system, where instead you would try to produce a rectangular depth map with no knowledge of the contained objects whatsoever. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Okay. No more questions at this point. So uh, we're breaking for lunch right now. Uh, one we and a half hours. We start at 2 p.m. We restart at 2 p.m. <laughs>